I am Rubik, the Grand Amigus. I remember, back when I first started playing Dota 2, the guy who taught me the basics of how to play also gave me tidbits of lore. He told me how Lena and Crystal Maiden were sisters, Viper used to be Pugna's pet, how the spirits were brothers, and that Aghanim, the guy from Aghanim Scepter, was Rubik's dad. While I didn't really get interested in the lore as a whole until later discovering Seraction Saxon's lorgasm, the wonder about Aghanim is something I've always found interesting. Who's Aghanim? Is he really Rubik's dad? Everyone hoped we would get these answers with Rubik's Arcana, but to everyone's disappointment, his Arcana added absolutely nothing to the lore. But now, with the new game mode, Aghanim's Labyrinth, as well as new info from new heroes, artifacts and underlords, we actually have a picture of who he is. But before we talk about him, let's first talk about who might be his child, the Grand Magus Rubik. From Rubik's lore bio, we learn that a mage can learn one or two spells, and if they study hard enough, they can become wizards. From Invoker's lore, we learn that a wizard can learn three or even four spells. Magic is all about memory, and some mages who don't have the intellect to recall them properly have to use grimoires to help them out. Invoker himself learned ten spells as a youth and could invoke them instantly, making him one of the greatest magicians ever. Rubik refers to Invoker as the Arsenal Magus. Among sorcerers, you see, the highest, most prestigious title you can get is that of a Magus. Rubik was famous for his talents in magic, and was constantly targeted by other mages trying to assassinate him. While early on it brought him excitement, he had grown weary of how predictable the attempts had become. And that was when he started to think about the possibility of him ascending to the title of Magus. And to do so, he announced he was going to kill one. As word spread, Rubik learned that threatening one Magus meant threatening all of them. They all came together to try to kill him all at once, but they soon discovered that their mastered spells of deadly magic seemed to reflect back on them. Where Invoker might have ten spells at his disposal, Rubik had a different kind of terrifying talent. As each magus targeted him, he observed and instantly threw the spell back at another, and soon this caused the maguses to suspect each other of betrayal and turned against one another. Many end up dead, more were gravely injured, but Rubik was but a bit sore. Sore, but happy and satisfied. And then, when he applied for the Magus position to the Hidden Council and the Insubstantial Eleven, no one could argue with him and granted him the title of Grand Magus. As Sir Action Slacks pointed out in his Rubik video, it seems like where Invoker has a great memory and therefore gets to store the very best spells to invoke at any time, Rubik is much more spontaneous. He is very good at copying incredible spells in the moment, but soon forgets them. When his spells expire, he has voice lines about this. Mm, how did that go again? I, I've forgotten something. The memory lasts only so long. They are both super strong maguses, but in each their end of the spectrum of memory. You could argue that where Invoker knows 10 spells at once for any occasion, which is insane, Rubik knows an infinite amount of spells for every occasion. One is wise where the other is cunning. Other than his base lore bio, his relationships tell us more of his story. Most heroes meeting Rubik are very friendly, which I find a bit strange. From his bio, he is clearly a sociopath and doesn't really come off as a good guy. Ah, Rubik, always a pleasure. Rubik may have been supposed to test Invoker when he was a child, meaning Rubik must be incredibly old. Invoker used a longevity spell ages ago, which means he must also have been a child a very, very long time ago. Does that mean Rubik is just as ancient? I was told you were the one to test me. Hmm. <laughs> I'm through with tests. Dark Willow is very mean to Rubik, saying this. Has Levin and your father shadow treated you? By father, she means Aghanim. Rubik, you're no enigma. You're a sad little boy, looking for approval. I assume here, too, she's talking about his father's approval. Pangolier, too, talks about him being in his father's shadow. Step out of your father's shadow, Rubik. The world awaits. Void Spirit is too a believer in Rubik being Aghanim's son. A great lineage comes to a nullifying end. And Wei, Antimage's disciple too. Now to find your father's staff. Snapfire makes a good point when meeting Rubik. Why can't you copy your friend's spells, Rubik? Seems like that'd be even easier. So why can he only copy enemy spells? Is it because he has to use his opponent's magic against themselves? He can't steal from someone who is working alongside him? I don't know. The boring answer is, probably because it's more balanced that way in-game. When Rubik himself meets an ally, he is often appreciative of fringe magic types. Anti-mage, your name aside, 
You're not half bad. Dragonus, you bring sorcery from the sky? How wonderful! Had you chosen to live, Lich, what a magus you could have been. Show me this demon witch sorcery of yours, Lion. And he has a fondness for Puck, for some reason. What a wondrous creation you are, When killing an enemy, he has three entire lines for Invoker. Even the Arsenal Magus falls before my magic. And he is opposed to Anti-Mage and Silencer, something that will be important later on when we talk about Rubik versus the Tyler Estate. I'll see your silence is eternal. Whatever do you have against me? While he likes the rare kind of magic Lion possesses and shows respect for it, he doesn't like Pugina's Oblivion Arts, or CM's and Lina's Elemental Magic. Sad to see such rare sorcery go to waste. May the arts of Oblivion die with you, Pugna. Oh, and shatter, cool and smolder. One relationship that's very strange is between Rubik and Pudge. Pudge's arcana voice lines are obsessed with Rubik. Here's a few of them. Thought you was gonna steal me hooks, did ya? Your old man died a has-been, Rubik. And you, I never was. Gonna save this for later. It's worth savoring. Time for the main course. <laughs> You're all right, Rubik. Even if you do talk funny. I don't know exactly what to make of this, both the content itself and the quantity of it. Now, before we talk about Aghanim, Rubik has a few interesting voice lines about him. When selecting, he says this. Would that I had father skill with construction. And when buying Aghanim Scepter, he says this. Father's a masterpiece. It's been so long since I held this. Which means three things. First of all, he believes himself he is Aghanim's son, and second, Aghanim constructs a lot, and third, Rubik once owned the scepter. His father being a constructor comes in handy to back up the theory that Rubik himself may be created rather than birthed. Dark Willow wants Rubik's staff, and also while at it, confirms that Aghanim is his father. Give me that staff, Rubik! I want your father's secrets! But Vanessa from Artifact is not so sure about Rubik's claim. Rubik claims to be Aghanim's son. I'm not sure I believe it, but I certainly wouldn't say that to Rubik's face. That brings us to Artifact. For details about the Tyler Estate, check out my anti-mage video. Here I will keep it brief. Basically, in the world of Dota 2, the Sapphire Archons are the authority when it comes to magic. They pursue bad magic abusers. But there's one city where they have their own magic rules and police, and that's Weeping Rose. In Weeping Rose, all sorts of eccentric magic is allowed, but that doesn't mean all kinds. If you break the magic laws made by the Quorum there, you will be persecuted by the Tyler Estate. Silencer is the Warden, and Antimage hunts down their targets. The reason why this matters is because we can see a story involving Rubik unfold in the card's Arcane Assault, Collateral Damage, and Arcane Censure. It seems like Rubik tried to steal some grimoire, got caught by Antimage the Cop, and then presented to Silencer the Warden. I hope we will see the continuation of this story in Artifact 2, where Rubik and Antimage are now heroes. But the most interesting card for this video is Aghanim Sanctum. Vanessa reads as follows. Aghanim is the greatest wizard of all time. There is no question, there is no debate. No one is his equal. So when he vanished one day, we never wondered how. We wondered why. Some say he feared for his life and ran into hiding, but I don't believe that for a second. You ask me. Aghanim is working on something, something important something that will change the world. That would probably be the scepter. And with that, let's discuss Aghanim himself. Any layman with a feeble grip can carve wood or hammer steel. Even the tender hands of a child can grasp a set of instructions. But to create something takes rare hands, shrewder hands, handsome, brilliant hands. The hands that forged the first scepter of power. My hands 
have slipped through dimensions, touching things that warp the mind and test the metal of the strongest will. From the far reaches of the astral plane, beyond countless dimensions, monsters, beasts, beasts without legs, beasts that are only legs, heroes that aren't heroes at all. I have brought them here to answer one simple question. Can your hands wield the true Aghanim Scepter? So instead of me summarizing what he is all about, I will just be lazy and let him tell you himself. Ah, you're here! Magnificent! I uh, suppose you're wondering why I've invited you here by capturing you. I am Aghanim. Yes, that Aghanim. Aghanim the Mighty. The Aghanim who studied dark forbidden magic and became lost across the astral dimensions in an effort to create a grand deceptor. I'm sure you heard lies of my works in Hero School. But here's something your stupid teachers didn't tell you. I didn't spend half an eternity wandering multiple dimensions feeling sorry for myself. No. Instead, I sought out the deadliest creatures from the darkest dimensions, hoping to one day bring them here to test the mettle of the mightiest heroes of the realm. That day is today. Let's begin. You've come! Excellent. I, uh, must apologize for smashing all of your scepters to bits. I found myself most invigorated upon my return, and I let that vigor get the best of me. I've been lost beyond the astral plane, moving hither and yon between dimensions for countless lifetimes. My mind is as warped as my sense of time. But for now, I am among friends. And friends, I'd love to share with you some of the wonders to be found across dimensions. Beasts to inspire fear, wonder, nausea, and death. Just, just great stuff. However, you are all mighty warriors in your own way. I doubt you will die over and over and over again, so hurry forth. Now, you may be wondering why Aghanim was traveling across dimensions to begin with. The story, not unlike some of you, is short and embarrassing. On your path to Grand Magus, you are taught many things, none of which is as important as this. Never, under any circumstances, transpose thyself across dimensions. But how does one craft a scepter of infinite power? by transposing thyself across dimensions. I was lost among the mists of creation until I heard a tiny voice reciting my words across the din of time. It was you, and you, and you, and you, calling me back, creating your quaint little versions of Agamem's scepter. So thank you, friends. Without your little incantations, I'd still be twisting through time and space. Valve dropped Aghanim's Labyrinth for this year's summer event, and it might be the best thing since Silfbreaker. While not many questions have been really plainly answered, it's nice to put a face to the legend. One thing a lot of people find strange, though, is that Aghanim doesn't look like any other kind except maybe Nature's Prophet. But Nature's Prophet is one of a kind sprung from the last seed of the goddess Veridesia, and what's especially strange is that Rubik, Aghanim's supposed son, doesn't look anything like him. So what? Well, the most common theory is that Rubik was not born from Aghanim, but rather created, like his scepter. Or, I don't know, Rubik is what happens when Octopus Man does hanky-panky with a hecking rock? If you think Legion Commander breeding with a goat is weird, Aghanim and the Labyrinth boss Storaga fricked. Yeah. Aghanim's Labyrinth also answers a good question about how, theoretically, 10 heroes can buy Ags at once in a game. How is that possible if there's only one scepter? Well, there is only one original scepter that Aghanim carries around. The ones you can buy in the shop are knockoffs. 
So that's all for Rubik and Aghanim. By the way, before you assume I endorse Rubik players, let me quickly make it clear that while I think his lore is dope, I absolutely hate this hero. Or, well, I love having him on the enemy team because it's a free game, but I swear every single game he's been on my own team has been an awful experience. Rubik players are usually support, right? So they're expected to pick first. And they do, they pick first, without even first seeing if the enemy has good spells to steal. And then, when you flame them for it, they say, Hehe, there's always a good spell to steal, don't worry. So I think, okay, fine, I will give you a chance, and oh god, he is dead already. By the time the game has hit the 10 minute mark, he has fed at least 5 times, and while he has 2 kills, that's not good. That's because Rubix always, without fail, kill secure, as they would call it, with fade bolts before they give you a colon P and tell you to relax. They always get a killing spree and then feed a shit ton of gold and think they did a good job. Have you also noticed they also always have a vomit inducing amount of cosmetic items, probably to compensate for going 0-20 every game, and you can bet they are passive aggressive in Swedish. They always fade bolt the creep wave later on when you as the carry is right in freaking front of it, and their mere presence is a tumor in your eye as you, they follow you around to either leech XP or feed while claiming they saved you, when you would be perfectly fine on your own. And all of this is worth it, right? Because they stole one ravage or one black hole, or as is more usual, steal one chrono and mess up the whole team fight so you lose the game. Rubik's lore is cool, sure, but do not even for a second think I approve of people who play this hero. Nothing makes me lose faith more than when my team picks him and then also wants to come safe lane with me. His mere presence is enough to tilt me. Okay, sorry for venting, you may leave now. Peace.